Good evening, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Father Benedict O'Kinsel, the president of the Athenaeum of Ohio and the rector of Mount St. Mary's, but obviously not for much longer, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's my privilege to welcome you to the Athenaeum and to Mount St. Mary's Seminary, this wonderful place. A special welcome uh, and thanks to Archbishop Laurie, the Archbishop of Baltimore, uh, for being here with us this evening, and to His Grace the Archb Archbishop Schnur, who's also with us here this evening, and to all of you, our honored guests. Thank you for being here uh, tonight. I want to welcome in particular the Knights of Columbus who are here with us. Archbishop Lori is the Supreme Chaplain of the Knights of Columbus. And I read this on the website today. It, it said, this is a quote, with the responsibility of overseeing the spiritual welfare of the order's 1.9 million members and their families. So. Uh, right. As well as running a, a diocese and uh, being the the, the chair of the committee on um, on the topic in which we're dealing with tonight, religious uh, freedom, and involvement in the USCCB also. So um, a very busy man, so we're particularly grateful for you taking time to visit us here in Cincinnati. Uh, to the Knights also, I wanted to say to thank you, to thank you also for your support your support to this particular seminary and our seminarians and seminarians throughout the country through your matching gift program that helps almost all seminarians throughout the country. We want to thank you for that. Also, thanks to the different councils in our own archdiocese that are members of our Bishop Fenwick Society, which is our fundraising, yearly fundraising, to support the seminary. And many of the councils are members of, of that society. So we want to thank you for all your support. Also, for the support that you give and the encouragement you give to seminarians and to priests uh, throughout, our, our, throughout our, our archdiocese very much appreciated. And of course, it's very much needed in these days when it's difficult to be a priest and it's difficult to be a seminarian. No complaints. We love being priests, right? Okay. We love being priests. We're not complaining about being hard. But it is good to have that encouraging word and that support. And the Knights of Columbus, they are, they are 100%. That, it's outstanding. So thank you for, for all of that. There is an information table at the back of the room with upcoming events uh, scheduled and other information. So please be sure as you're, as you're leaving to take some of the magazines along with you. In your seats, there are cards which, uh, which aren't complaint cards, okay? You know, they're, they're information cards. But if you have some ideas that you think, here's something, here's a talk that we think maybe the seminary could be engaged in or a program the seminary might, might help us with, please be sure to write down your ideas. If you want to be on our mailing list, put your, your name and address on there, and we'll make sure that we include you on our mailing lists as well. It's my distinguished privilege to introduce Father David Andrus, who is the Dean of the Athenaeum and the Seminary, and he will introduce our guest speaker and the lecture for this evening. Thank you. We are, of course, uh, delighted to have Archbishop William, William Laurie here this evening. Archbishop Laurie was born near Louisville, Kentucky, and obtained a bachelor's degree from the seminary of St. Pius X, uh, just across the river in Erlanger. He is also a graduate of the other Mount St. Mary's, Mount St. Mary's Seminary in Emmitsburg, Maryland, uh, and he has obtained a doctorate in sacred theology from the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. Archbishop Lorry was ordained to the priesthood for the Archdiocese of Washington by His Eminence William Cardinal Baum in 1977. In 1995, Archbishop Lorry was ordained to the Episcopate as Auxiliary Bishop of Washington and in 2001 became Bishop of Bridgeport, Connecticut. In 2012, he was installed as the 16th Archbishop of the Archdiocese of Baltimore. And as you've already heard, he has a very important role as Supreme Chaplain to our Knights of Columbus throughout this country and even internationally. 
He is especially well suited to address tonight's topic, which is that of religious liberty. In the year 2011, he was named to chair the newly formed Committee for Religious Liberty of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. And that committee has continued to address the growing concerns over the erosion of our religious freedom. We, of course, find ourselves uh, in this particular moment in time only days away from our national elections. And we know that this issue of religious freedom is of, of grave importance uh, to us who are Catholic. We want to certainly welcome Archbishop Laurie. We're grateful for your willingness to be here this evening, and we certainly look forward to your address. Thank you so much, uh, Archbishop Schnur, for inviting me. We uh, go back many a year and many happy associations and a lot of work together. So it is a, a privilege to visit your great archdiocese. Father Rector, thank you for your hospitality. Father Andrus, for your kind uh, introduction. And uh, Robert Collins, uh, our state deputy, thank you so much for uh, turning out uh, the knights and, and their wives in, in force tonight. I think we've pretty much taken over the place. So thank you so much. Listening to that introduction, um, only really one thought came into my mind. That they, they really don't pay me enough. They really don't. Um, I was uh, born, as you heard, in uh, New Albany, Indiana. That's about 90 miles downstream. It's a part of the world they call Kentuckiana. And uh, even though I was uh, growing up in the land of the Louisville Slugger, uh, I rooted for the Cincinnati Reds. So I don't know a thing about religious freedom. That's why you actually invited me. <laughs> Uh, as you heard, I, I served as Bishop of Bridgeport, Connecticut from uh, 2001 to 2012. It was a time when I got to know a whole other part of the country and working in Connecticut, met with many fine uh, public officials. And with the bishops of Connecticut, we, we tried to create harmonious relations between church and state. But in the year two. 2009, a really big problem came up. Um, the Catholic community was really surprised when legislation was introduced that proposed to reorganize how Catholic parishes operate. In essence, the bill would have sidelined uh, the pastor from all decisions involving church administration, and it mandated that an elected committee of laity uh, would have taken care of this, and of course, the bishop would have been uh, just a figurehead. Um, a nice plan if you're a Congregationalist, but that just isn't who we are. Um, the clergy certainly mobilized, but even more so, the laity mobilized. We had a big rally on the steps of the Capitol, the bill was withdrawn, and um, you might say we lived happily ever after, but we did not. You, you might also say the song ended, but the melody lingered on. Seemed clear at that point, we really just couldn't take uh, our religious freedom protections for granted anymore. So I decided to write a, a, a pastoral letter on religious freedom, and as it turned out, many bishops around the country were finding similar challenges to religious freedom. And so it was that the Bishops' Conference decided to make the fostering and the protection of religious freedom a priority. They established this ad hoc committee on religious liberty, which I continue to share. And it is our way of focusing our efforts to teach about religious freedom, which is what I'm doing tonight, and also focusing our efforts to protect this 
first and very fundamental liberty. In light of that experience, I'd like to talk about religious freedom tonight as gift and challenge, but to do this through the lens of the document from the Second Vatican Council on Religious Liberty, the Declaration on Religious Liberty, known as Dignitatis Humanae, of human dignity. It was issued uh, some 51 years ago on December the 7th, uh, 1965, but even though it's 51 years old, this document could have been issued yesterday. It really retains its importance and its relevance uh, in light of the challenges to religious freedom that we see at home and abroad. So thank you. Thank you for the chance to come here tonight and talk about something that is really very near and very dear to my heart plan for the talk is very simple. I'd like to offer a summary of the most basic ideas in that declaration uh, on religious freedom. Then I'd like to give a little summary of some of the challenges that we're facing uh, again at home and abroad. And thirdly, I'd like to talk a little bit about what our response ought to be. So I'd like to now move to what I call our cliff notes about Dignitatis Humanae, the Declaration on Religious Liberty. Um, if you don't mind, for the rest of this talk, I'm not going to say Declaration on Religious Liberty, and I'm not going to say Dignitatis Humanae. I'd like to call the document by its initials, DH. So um, that'll be a lot easier on your ears and easier on my tongue. So let me begin with, really I'll have two sets of questions, three preliminary questions to help us understand how the document came about, and then three content questions. So let's do three and three. And the preliminary questions, first of all. Let's first ask, had the church ever spoken about religious freedom uh, until the Second Vatican Council? The answer is yes, it did. For example, in the 19th century, Pope Leo XIII championed uh, the rights of the church against anti-religious uh, ideologies that would have been embedded in things like Bismarck's Kulturkampf. Uh, Pius XI defended the liberty of the church against the rise of totalitarian governments in the 1930s, and Pope Pius XII um, spoke out not only on behalf of the rights of the church, but also the rights of the victims of World War II, something for which he seldom, if ever, gets credit. That said, DH was the first official church document solely dedicated to religious liberty, and it's certainly the first time an ecumenical council ever dealt with it. So why? Why did the council decide to do this? Well, I was um, about nine years old at the time, so I have to speculate. It was, nine, it was the end of the 50s, the beginning of the 60s. Uh, memories of World War II and the, the atrocities of World War II were fresh in people's minds. The Holocaust against the Jews, uh, the many religious minorities, including Catholics, who suffered. At that time, religious liberty was all but denied for millions of people living behind the Iron Curtain. At the same time, secularism and atheism uh, were on the rise. If you have some miles on your odometer, as I do, you might remember the 1966 um, front cover of Time magazine emblazoned with the words, Is God Dead? There was some bad news, but there was also good news. Part of the good news was that in those days, the American experiment of limited government and religious freedom was working pretty well. And there were a lot of developing countries with aspirations for freedom 
including religious freedom. And so in convoking the Second Vatican Council, uh, Pope John XXIII wanted to bring the church into closer contact with the conflicts, but also the yearnings of a developing global culture. He wanted, in other words, to read the signs of the times and to interpret the signs of the times in light of the gospel. I think that's where DH fits in to the program of Vatican II. A second preliminary question. Um, the proposal for doing a document on religious freedom back in those days was controversial. And so why was it opposed and on what grounds? Well, I think it's fair to say that most of the opposition came from countries where there was an established church, like um, Spain or Italy. Um, some also opposed the early drafts of this document on religious freedom on the grounds that, and I quote, error has no rights. It's a bit of a paraphrase of Pope Pius IX's syllables of errors. In other words, in defending the religious rights of every religion or no religion at all, there was some concern that we'd fall into what is called indifferentism. Indifferentism means one religion is as good as another. And there was also concern that the church would be abandoning its claims to proclaim the fullness of truth, the fullness of the, Catholic, of the Christian gospel. One more preliminary question before we get into the content, and it's this. Were there developments in Catholic thought in the 20th century that paved the way for this document? The answer is yes. The 20th century produced many brilliant theologians and philosophers, and without their groundbreaking work, the Second Vatican Council would not have been possible. One of the major areas of development was giving a fuller and more theological account of human dignity. Now, the church had always taught about human dignity, that life is sacred, that we're made in God's image, that we can know the existence of God even by our reason. But some 20th century thinkers went a little further. They sort of went back, not only to the scriptures, but to early Christian writers, and focused on the desire for God in the depth of the human person. They saw this innate desire for God as the basis of human dignity. In other words, just by reason of being human, every person has an inbuilt relatedness to God. And this perdures in spite of original sin. It exists even prior to baptism or any specific religious commitment. So it's not just our brains, it's not just our thumbs that set us apart from all the other animals, but rather a universal inbuilt aspiration for a life and a love that is infinite. And so our dignity, human dignity, is transcendent in its source and in its summit, namely God. Human rights, dignity are granted, not by any earthly power, but are God's gift. And that is why this Declaration on Religious Liberty begins with the words of human dignity, dignitatis humanae. Now let's go to the content question. Now I have to give you a fair warning. This is going to be the longest part of the talk. You'll need a break when it's over. This is like the stretch of I-70 that goes from Columbus to Wheeling. <laughs> All right, and so you're getting the idea of this. You're, I hope you had coffee here because this is. And this is and what I'm about to do. And, and have I broken this thing? 
Uh, I'm not. Okay. So thank you very much. Okay. So where am I? Okay. Um, the longest stretch is this, and it's, it, it's the answer to the question, how did the Second Vatican Council understand what religious freedom is? This is really the heart of my talk. So the word freedom has a lot of meanings, doesn't it? The big one in our culture is the freedom to choose. The freedom to choose one religion as opposed to another, the freedom to choose no religion at all. That's really not where DH is at. The first description of religious freedom in DH is freedom from coercion. It declares that the human person has a right to religious freedom and goes on to say this, and I quote, such freedom consists in this, that all should be immune from coercion on the part of individuals, social groups, or any human power, so that no one is forced to act against his conscience in religious matters, or prevented from acting according to his conscience in private or in public, whether alone or with others within due limits. That's from DH number one. Well, we need to focus on this because we Americans had a lot to do with that contribution to this part of the Declaration. In fact, it was championed by an American theologian named John Courtney Murray, a Jesuit. He advised a number of bishops at Vatican II, including your own former Archbishop Carl Alter. They worked very closely together, and also he worked very closely with Cardinal Spellman. Father Murray, in proposing religious freedom as freedom from coercion, was borrowing a lot from the American experiment of limited government. Thanks to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, the American government declares itself incompetent, as it were, to deal with specifically religious matters absent some compelling interest. In other words, the government declares that it will not take positions about religious matters, but instead give individuals and religious bodies very wide latitude and will intervene only when there is an issue, a reason involving the good of society. The task of government according to this view, is not to foster religious values or practice, but simply to protect religious people and their institutions from undue constraints. That said, Murray believed that government should recognize that religion plays a constructive role in people's lives. It contributes to human flourishing. And Murray also contended that the success of the American experiment depended, first of all, on a spirit of civility, we'd like to get that back, and on a consensus, not about every subject, but a broad consensus about morality and religion and their role in society. We'd probably like to get that back too. Why did Murray champion this point of view? Well, first of all, he felt like this, uh, like he felt that this American model of religious liberty offered the church a way forward to encourage religious freedom in countries all over the world. So he felt this was a good model for the church to adopt. And secondly, um, he felt that uh, this concept of religious freedom worked well in pluralistic societies that allow for broad freedoms of speech and expression. This concept enables societies to recognize religious freedom as a universal right common to people of differing religious persuasions or none at all. In fact, the 1948 UN uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights would have taken this same position. Well, 
you'd have to almost have been there 51 years ago, or actually more than 51 years ago, to know that it was not easy to get this point of view into a church document. Here again, many people feared that uh, Murray's views would lead to religious indifferentism, the view that one religion is good as another. And the question was asked, well, what if the moral consensus on which this neutral view of religious freedom hinges breaks down? Would a society torn apart by competing moral and religious claims set the stage for the government to act as referee over those claims? Murray perhaps didn't have a crystal ball to see what was ahead, but he certainly wrote clearly on our personal obligations to pursue the truth, but he felt that a neutral or juridical approach to religious liberty was simply the best approach from the perspective of constitutional order and laws and public policy. So that's number one, freedom from coercion. Still on the bandwagon here? Good, now, if you said no, I guess I'd just get back on the plane and go back to Baltimore. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna do the second thing. The second view of religious liberty is not just the freedom from, this is a freedom to. This is the freedom to pursue the truth in religious matters. So, the notion of religious freedom as an absence of or immunity from coercion, that got into DH, it's in there, it's emblazoned, it's our American contribution, and we should be very proud of it. But it was challenged, uh, and one of the, the challenger in chief was uh, an archbishop from Krakow named Karol Wojtyla, so that's pretty powerful. But he challenged Murray's notion of freedom, not because he thought it was wrong, but because he felt it needed to be more complete. As we saw in our preliminary question number three, Wojtyla and others were urging the council to adopt a more profoundly theological understanding of human dignity. And they felt that a merely neutral view of religious freedom emptied of content would not really take into account the transcendent dignity of the human person made in God's likeness and endowed with reason and free will. But it is precisely in human transcendence, this inbuilt orientation toward the divine, that all human rights and all human freedoms have their origin. When religious freedom is linked to the human search for the truth, for truth and for God, we can see much more readily that it is not the state that grants our basic freedoms, but rather God who grants our freedoms. When religious freedom is thought of merely as the absence from coercion, it's easy to see how government could claim to be not just the guarantor of our rights, but also the grantor of our rights. So Wojtyla and his allies, mostly the French bishops, did an awful lot to shape uh, the final form of DH. Um, while acknowledging that religious freedom includes freedom from coercion, what did they do? They rooted it in human nature, that it has its foundation, they said, in the very dignity of the human person, and they said this is known both by reason and revelation. The text puts it this way, it is in accord with their dignity that all men and women, because they are persons endowed with reason and free will, and thus privileged with personal responsibilities, are impelled by their nature and bound by a moral obligation to seek the truth, especially the truth concerning, uh, concerning religion. 
And so it was that Voitiba stood on the council floor and uttered these words sort of heard round the world. He said, and this is the Latin version because it sounds much more impressive in Latin, non datur libertas sine veritate. There is no liberty without truth. There is no liberty unless the full truth about the human person is acknowledged. There is no liberty unless the human person has a right that is respected by government to seek for truth with regard to morality and to religion. Any society that is just will protect religious freedom, but also will protect the truth about human transcendence. Any society that is just will respect the obligation of a human person and a human community to seek for moral and religious truth and encourage that search as a societal good. Well, in um, arguing for the link between freedom and truth, um, Archbishop Wojtyla was drawing on his experience as a philosopher and as a theologian, but he was also drawing on his experience uh, of living in a country, a communist country, where the full truth about the human person was compromised by the overarching claims of a totalitarian state. But Archbishop Wojtyla was not naive. He also knew that secular democratic states could eclipse human dignity absent any fixed moral truths rooted in human nature. Because when truths about human dignity and morality and justice are up for grabs, they are grabbed. They're grabbed by the powerful who impose their views on others. The stronger, the more powerful, the more influential upon the weaker. And one more point. Um, D.H. says that religious freedom is to be fostered and protected within due limits. That's a very loaded and important phrase. What does it mean? Some people said that this phrase meant that religious freedom was protected so long as the public order was not in any way harmed. But again, Archbishop Wojtyla and his allies cautioned this. Um, when you use the public order argument, you are opening a lot of doors. Wojtyla knew that public order claims could be very exp expansive even dominant. And so he ensured that the document on religious freedom would take a more nuanced view. He said any limits on religious liberty for the common good had to be rooted in the requirements of the moral law, this law of God written on our hearts, known by reason, but understood more fully in the light of revelation. Religious freedom is violated when a government constrains individuals and religious groups from following the natural moral law. And so in an era of government regulations opposed to the natural moral law, I think the future Pope's words seem pretty prophetic. Okay, we've gotten to Zanesville. <laughs> I have lingered, uh, I've lingered over this understanding of religious freedom in NDH because it's so fundamental. So a couple of quick content questions. And, 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 the first, and the second of them is this. What does Revelation actually say about religious freedom? In other words, scripture and tradition. What do they have to say about religious freedom? Well, if you pick up the document, and I'd encourage you to do this, the second half of it is entitled, Religious Freedom in the Light of Revelation. Now, let's be clear. Religious freedom 
uh, appears nowhere in the Bible. It's not a clear and distinct biblical concept. Instead, it sort of arises from a composite picture of who Jesus is. The, the image of Jesus as meek and humble of heart. Jesus who listened with compassion toward those he encountered. Jesus who showed mercy to erring sinners while challenging them to conversion. Jesus who taught us about the wheat and the weeds growing up in the field, warning us at the same time we'd have one day to give an account of our freedom. Jesus who acknowledged the legitimacy of civil power, but clearly warned that the higher rights of God must be upheld. And it was the Lord who taught us that the truth sets us free. Out of this image of Christ emerges a consistent church teaching, namely that our response to God in faith must be free. Our response to God in faith must be voluntary. Religious freedom is that gift that enables us um, not simply to choose one religion over another, but to respond in freedom, to respond in love to a God who loves us so. In scripture, we see how God draws us to himself and evokes from us this free response of love. And the document invites us to see that wholehearted faith in Christ and in the church is the ultimate fulfillment of this God-given gift of human freedom. And let me note just in passing that the document sees no conflict between what Revelation teaches about religious freedom and, and about what reason teaches. There's a final content question, uh, and it's this. Is religious freedom related to evangelization in the document, in, in DH? The answer is yes. If you, again, if you pick up the document, you find that it opens with the Lord's commission to the apostles to go out and to spread the gospel and to baptize in the name of the Trinity. So let me share a couple of ways in which DH contributes to our understanding of evangelization. First of all, DH connects individual religious liberty with our religious liberty as a church. That is to say, the church's freedom to fulfill the mission given her by the Lord. Since religious freedom is anchored in human nature, the individual is the primary subject for religious liberty. Yet religious bodies and groups also have a right to religious freedom. So how is individual and communal religious freedom related? Well, first of all, there is the innate relatedness of human beings to God and to others. We don't live as isolated individuals. We live as members of communities. And so our rights, our dignity, sort of migrate to the communities that we form, including religious communities. And so DH teaches that individual believers who open their hearts to God in acts that are voluntary and free have a right to express those interior religious acts externally. Participating with others in religious matters, professing their religious faith in a communal way. Conversely, it teaches that the church as a spiritual authority must have as much freedom in action as the care for our salvation would demand. And so the church claims for herself freedom as a society of men and women who have the right to live in civil society according to the precepts of the Christian faith. And the state has the obligation to protect uh, 
the religious freedom of both individuals and church communities. And so there, is a, uh, um, there are some implications to this. Namely, the dimensions of religious freedom are the same for both individuals and for groups. Both have the right of free inquiry. Both have the right to search for truth and for God. Both have the right to proclaim their faith publicly and privately. Both have the right and duty to seek the truth and to hold to it once it's known. And both have the right to order their whole life in accord with its demands. This is right out of DH. For individuals, this would extend to going about one's daily work in accord with the moral demands of the gospel. It includes the rights of individuals to bear witness to their faith, even when its teachings are countercultural. And churches are entitled, D.H. says, to govern themselves according to their own norms in fulfillment of their mission. And beyond that, religious liberty also includes the right to influence society, to help shape society, and to contribute to the common good. And this we do. This we do in a thousand ways. Think about the, the effect of your own parish. Think about the schools and the contribution they make to the common good. Think about the amazing array of charities. In almost every place you look in the United States, the church is the largest non-governmental source of charitable and social services. And this is done certainly to meet human needs, but it is also done to help shape a society that is just and peaceful and compassionate. Um, so that would, that kind of, now here's one thing that's really clear. I said I was giving you the cliff notes on this stuff, huh? It's clear that if I work for cliff notes, I'd be fired by now. <laughs> I would suggest we have a few minutes if we would just stand up and take a deep breath. That would be a great idea. And then I'll bring this thing home. Okay, how y'all feeling? You feeling pretty good? You ready to roll again? Anybody know uh, how the World Series is going? <laughs> yeah, what is it? Just started. Oh, man, boo, boo, boo. Who's rooting for the Indians here? Yeah, yeah me too, yeah, okay, good. All right. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about current threats to religious freedom. Uh, this kind of brings it all into our century, into our times. What does it mean? Um, you, we cannot begin to talk about religious freedom uh, without looking to the persecution of Christians in the Middle East and elsewhere. We've all seen the heartbreaking images of young men being beheaded uh, simply because they are Christian. I've visited numbers of times with uh, bishops from places like Aleppo and Syria, in Erbil in Iraq. Their people have been decimated by what the State Department, at the urging of the Knights of Columbus, finally declared to be genocide. This is a massive violation of human rights. And it is especially important for us to realize that these Christians are our brothers and sisters. And so it is important for us to keep the flame of, faith, of, of freedom burning brightly in our country. It's important for us also to look across the way and to see what societies devoid of religious freedom can become. Uh, it is a dehumanizing thing. It should remind us 
that religious freedom is not a partisan issue. It has nothing to do, should have nothing to do with being Democrat or Republican. It is a human right, a human issue, and profoundly so. Secondly, we have some religious freedom problems here at home, don't we? Um, I'm, I don't want to depress you or anything like that, so I'm going to kind of kind of tick them off and not go too deep in any one of them. Um, these would include efforts to uh, reduce religious freedom to freedom of worship, um, increased, uh, increasing attempts by government to interfere with the internal life of churches. Uh, they include attempts to encroach on the freedom of churches to hire for mission and to provide benefit plans in accord with their moral teachings. A church-run social services face licensure challenges if they don't buckle under. And of course, many church adoption services have been forced to close down because of our support for traditional marriage. Christian colleges face threats to accreditation because of their Christian identity. And religious groups on campuses face free speech and assembly challenges. We have seen battles in various states, including the neighboring state of Indiana, over attempts to pass um, RIFRA laws, Religious Freedom Restoration Acts, that stipulate that state government can only interfere in religious matters when there is a compelling interest using the least restrictive means. Likewise, Obergefell, the Supreme Court decision that legalized same-sex marriage, has raised a host of religious freedom challenges affecting adoption services, hiring for mission, our schools, and pastoral practice. And Pope Francis has a way of summing everything up. He called this the polite persecution that is going on in the West. Probably the most high-profile religious liberty issue in our country is the so-called HHS um, contraceptive mandate. And you, you know what that is. That was the attempt. Well, it's not just an attempt. That is the decision of Health and Human Services um, to force employers to include at no cost to the employee in the health insurance plan um, contraception, sterilization, abortion-inducing drugs, and also uh, reproductive counseling for the minor children of employees. Uh, when it came out in 2011, there was no religious exemption. Uh, there was quite a storm of controversy was raised. And what happened next was an accommodation was granted. Um, so it took, it looked at us and it said, okay, some things you do are really religious, like you run parishes. That's really religious. You want to go in church, knock yourself out for an hour a week, that's great. But the other things you do uh, are out serving the public. These are less religious and they would include things like schools and charities. They were granted an accommodation. And it's gone through many, many iterations, but the long and the short of it is that in some way, the religious employer that did not want to supply these so-called services in its healthcare plan um, would voice or write or express their objection. And the objection would trigger the provision of those services using the health care plan as the vehicle for delivering them. The only thing is the religious organization that objected um, wouldn't have to pay for them. Well, um, it's pretty entangling and, you know, uh, a lot of people had a lot of different views about this, but who steps up into the spotlight but the little sisters of the poor and they decide they're not going to do this. And they go all the way to the Supreme Court. And I have to say, uh, they did so with, uh, with, with joy and with grace and challenge. They didn't do it in an angry way. 
they were sort of uh, happy warriors about all of this. And uh, the Supreme Court heard them, uh, actually gave a fairly constructive uh, suggestion as to how the government's objectives and our objectives could be met without entangling the two too much. Um, but then they sent it back to the lower courts and that's where things stand at the moment. I wish I could tell you that that was the last of the mandates. I would love for it to be the last of the mandates, but um, the Affordable Health Care Act gave HHS broad regulatory powers, and so lots of mandates are coming down, including right now um, a mandate that is not just about providing things in your health care plan, this is a mandate to, help to hospitals that they have to do certain forms of transgender surgery that are, again, not in accord with our teaching, and there is no religious exemption to those. So there is, might we say, more uh, to follow. At the, at the end of the day, the end of the day, this whole, um, struggle for religious freedom is not just about our finding a way to tiptoe around these regulations. Religious freedom means a lot more than that. It means the freedom to form and sustain institutions that take the gospel to heart and deliver services in accord with love of God and love of neighbor, that deliver services in accord with the church's understanding of human dignity, that are shaped by a whole beautiful ethos. That's what religious freedom is for. It's not just a matter of tiptoeing around policies and regulations. And really, that's what we should be struggling for. The final thing I'll say in terms of the struggles that we face are those of individuals, small businesses, who um, do not want to become entangled in things they find morally objectionable. A lot of very good, innocent people have suffered. A big company like uh, Hobby Lobby um, was able to mount a big defense over the HHS mandate, go to the Supreme Court and win, um, but um, now they've been granted a, an accommodation, so they're in the same uh, bowl of stew that we are. Um, th this just gives you kind of a quick overview of some of the things that we are facing. So, finally, to conclude, how should we respond? Well, suggestion number one, big surprise, we should pray. We should pray every day. We should pray every day for these persecuted Christians abroad. We should pray every day for the restoration of religious freedom at home. Uh, as scripture says, we should be praying for elected officials, for judges. We should be praying for church officials and good lay people who are in the crosshairs. And we should pray very hard as this election unfolds next week. We need wise and good leaders. The Knights of Columbus have launched a novena for our country using a prayer attributed loosely to John Carroll, our nation's first archbishop. I'd urge you to pray that prayer between now and the election. Number two. I think we should take Pope Francis at his word and deepen our relationship to Christ and make sure that we are constantly undergoing what he calls a missionary conversion, such that you and I are the agents of evangelization in our world. President Garvey of Catholic University once said that if we want to defend religious freedom, we've got to love God more. When our faith is awakened by encountering Christ and falling in love with him, our appreciation of the precious gift of religious freedom is heightened. Conversely, as faith and the values of faith recede, the appreciation of religious freedom 
diminishes and a void is created in the lives of individuals and families and communities, a void that is often filled by governmental intervention. It's great for bishops to stand up and make statements about religious freedom, but unless their church communities are alive and vital and people understand and love their faith and are willing to stand up for their faith lovingly, it doesn't make that big of a difference. A third thing is we have to find creative ways to engage the culture all around us. When Pope Francis came to the United States, he urged us to build a society that is tolerant and inclusive and a society that rejects every form of unjust discrimination. In other words, he's urging us to use our liberty to build a just and peaceful society. Those of you preparing to be ordained, those of you who are ordained, um, recognize the need to accompany the people we are privileged to serve. We got to listen to them, ask them questions, and in that context, create an opening for the church's teaching. In a word, we have to do a better job informing our fellow Catholics for faithful citizenship. It's not that we don't say the right things, it's just that we aren't communicating it effectively. It's also true that political figures are sometimes engaged by church officials, people like me, only in the heat of a difficult situation, like a piece of legislation that threatens the church. I think we have to continually try to build bridges, even with those who disagree and act against the church's teaching. I think we have to have more discussions at the level of principle. We also have to raise up from our own ranks principled political leaders. Searching for common ground is hard work. Authentic dialogue is hard work. Finding the opportunity and framework for doing this is hard work. But without this kind of engagement, I think the future looks very difficult. Fourth suggestion pertains to education. You've been very kind to spend time with me today reflecting on the church's teaching about religious liberty. But how many people, and many of our fellow Catholics, don't really have much of an idea about this? How many young people, we love our millennials, we need our millennials, but how many times have they gone through school and not been taught about the fundamentals of their faith or about the fundamentals of our country? And how many times has the church been portrayed in Western civilization courses as the really bad actor in Western civilization instead of the force that built it? A fifth suggestion is that we think about all the people we have influence with. We all have a network. It's not just politicians who have a network. There's, we have friends, we have relatives, we have colleagues, and we should ask ourselves, are we using that network? Not to beat people over the head, not to be a zealot so that they all run the other way, but rather to get people engaged and to create, once again, the opening, to share the church's teaching in a way that it can actually be heard. And finally, there, we can't wait till all of this is in perfect condition before we speak with our politicians. And so there are networks within the church for doing this. We have state Catholic conferences. We have our own bishops conference. And these are vehicles for making known to elected officials what is of great importance to us. And while we do not engage in partisan politics, um, we do need to be politically active. We do need uh, to exercise our citizenship uh, and 
to encourage anyone running for office uh, to uphold our basic freedoms. And finally, uh, while I'm up here boldly making suggestions, many of you, uh, those of you preparing for the priesthood, are, are thinking about exercising your priesthood in a context that will probably be very different than the times in which we are now living. And many of you are in the world every day bearing witness to Christ and to the church. I came tonight to say thank you. And I, I came tonight to ask your prayers uh, for our church and for our country, for the Knights of Columbus, for our future priests, that we might indeed create a civilization of truth and of love. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Archbishop Laurie, for a very excellent talk. And I know that uh, it's one that has probably uh, awakened in your minds um, some questions or comments. So uh, we have just a little bit of time to, to entertain uh, a few questions. My understanding is that the uh, microphone will be brought to you. Is that correct? No. Where is Oh, microphone's right there. Zwee, can you bring it to those that uh, have a question? Any questions? Okay, now we got we got to run it to the far back of the room here, uh, the very back row here. Thank you. Thank you for coming here and speaking. I'm a United States Marine Corps veteran. We spent six years in the Marine Corps defending the very liberties that you shared with us tonight. I shared my faith, church teaching doctrines during my treatment at the Cincinnati VA and was retaliated against by the VA and illegally denied care. This has been going on for years. I first reached out to the VA hospital and was lied to and ignored. I went to veterans organizations and they told me this is not what they do. A couple of them tried to help, but was lied to and ignored by the VA. I went to Senator Portman's office, filled out the form, made regular contacts with him, was lied to and ignored. Finally facing him when I found out at a, that he was at a public forum, and he promised me that he would uh, take action on my behalf. Unfortunately, that was another lie. I did the same thing with Congressman Shabbat, filled out the forms emailed him, called him, was lied to, ignored. Faced him at a Tea Party event, asked him to promise me that he would meet with me and take action on, his, on my behalf. Found out that was a lie. Spoke to Congressman Winstrup at the Portman event, who sits on the Vin Veteran Affairs Committee. He basically gave me, well, I don't know what to tell you, turned around and walked away, was ignored and betrayed. Went to my church priest, and he had no clue what to do. He referred me to some organizations within the church, and sadly to say, none of my calls were returned. I'm all alone, at least. There are other veterans in similar circumstances, but everything on here that you put on there, the things that we should do, I've done a thousand times over. And the, I guess the most, I can, I can accept when somebody disagrees with me and reacts the way that they did. I can come to peace with that. What saddens me most was, that I found out was, the last, the last place that I thought of going to was my church. I tried all the other routes first because I, knew no, I didn't know where to go to to my church. And sadly, I found out that there's nowhere in my church that will advocate and defend my liberties after I spent six years defending theirs. So I ask you, I've done everything you've said, and yet I stand alone. Any recommendations? Because it's very disheartening. And very, I drove all the way across town from the west side. I got lost twice coming here to 45 minutes. 
hoping to get a voice finally, not only for me as a veteran of faith, but my brothers and sisters who are also suffering because of their faith. Thank you. Oh, here we go. Uh, thank you for um, thank you for your service to our country. Thank you for putting your life on the line. And I know that you and many veterans today uh, in the United States are having a very very difficult way to go. And I think we all need to acknowledge that. And I would hope simply by your raising it tonight in this forum uh, that perhaps uh, a way will be found uh, through the church uh, to assist you. I'm, I'm obviously a visitor, but I understand uh, very much uh, the need to make a response to circumstances such as yours. But thank you for your service. Other questions, please. I think, oh, you have to wait for the microphone. I'm sorry, okay. Your Eminence, this is also more of an addition too, and not so much a question, but you, you cannot stress education too much. Um, we need to know about the great encyclicals our popes of the last two centuries have written, uh, whether it's Pope Leo XIII, Rerum Novarum, speaking against socialism, but also the U.S. history going back to Thomas Jefferson's letter to the Baptists of Danbury, <clears throat> Connecticut, in around 1801, mm -hmm. when he talked about the wall of separation of church and state. It did not, as you said, imply coercion, or rather a separation, so that we are free to do what morality and our conscience and our faith tells us we need to do. And so uh, an interesting thing, so in 1801, uh, Jefferson wrote that letter to the Baptists in Danbury. I used to be, that, used, that was my neck of the woods once upon a time. And they, were, they wrote to Jefferson uh, because until 1819, the Congregational Church was the official church of Connecticut. So the Baptists were not having an easy way to go. Um, so Jefferson sends back this very important letter. He uses the analogy of, of, a, of the wall of separation of church and state, as it were. Um, they didn't particularly like it, and they put it in a drawer someplace. It was only found later on. But to give you some idea of what happened next, um, the uh, following Sunday after Jefferson sent that letter, uh, religious services were held in the well of the House of Representatives. So I don't know what kind of a wall that was, but uh, I don't think that that they meant antipathy. Uh, what they meant was a mutual respect and a recognition of distinct spheres. It did not mean that they don't relate to each other because society is not like that. So. Thanks for bringing that up. And, and your larger point about uh, learning about our encyclicals, the Vatican II, about our church history um, couldn't be more important. The more we know, the less they can put one over on us. So thank you so much. Other questions? I see somebody back there. Um, the church has a vocabulary that she uses when she talks about issues and our the American Secular Society also has a vocabulary, and they're not always the same. Is there a danger that the church will be misunderstood when she speaks about religious freedom in the context of American Secular Society? Thank you very much. That's an excellent question, and I'm glad you brought it up, because yes, indeed, that is true. So every we do have our own vocabulary, and we've been honing this vocabulary for some 2,000 years. And those of us who've grown up in the church speak it. But these, and there was a time, there was a place when these concepts had a much broader understanding and acceptance across society. I remember uh, talking with somebody about how labor leaders in the 1930s 
would quote the social encyclicals of the church, and uh, today uh, it sounds like a foreign language. The culture of engagement means talking long enough, civilly enough, and respectfully enough to understand where the dissonance is and addressing it so that while you might not come out with a completely um, a, a complete agreement about vocabulary, there's a greater degree of understanding. And I think that's part of the hard work of dialogue. So very often we can be like ships in the night. What we s defend as freedom, some people see as discrimination. What we defend as a human good and in accord with the natural law, many people see very differently. Even the notion of natural law is uh, no longer well understood um, in, in our culture today. It still exists. Not understanding it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It does, but it's not well understood. So an excellent point, and I thank you for it. I saw one other person. Make it good. I'll try. <laughs> In this month's uh, issue of Columbian Magazine, you wrote about this topic, and you know you stressed some of the same points that you gave in this talk. Uh, Cardinal Whirl, I think, has come out on occasion to be fairly vocal on some of the things, especially when it came to HHS. And I guess the problem I have, and I guess the comment I would I would like to know is. As Catholics, we're taught, you know, the golden rule and almost turn the other cheek. And I think engagement and, and civil discourse sometimes takes the course of, at least for Catholics, almost, almost backing off and being too meek. And I guess my question to you would be, what else should we be doing that, in my opinion, is more forceful as a laity and as a clergy to address our political leaders about what we think are our fundamental rights and being certainly very vocal or at least very I'll use the word obstinate about what we feel are moral imperatives that you know we can't cross that line well thank you uh, let me answer uh, you ask a question on a number of levels and I think uh, that there are points that I'm, I'm glad to, to try to clarify number one uh, dialogue does not mean heading it doesn't mean just being nice. Okay, dialogue means that you, um, it doesn't mean you compromise. It means you look deeper into what you believe. It doesn't mean you give up your convictions, but see where you can make a connection that was not perceived before. That is one of the things you got to do. That is certainly what the early Catholics did. Uh, my predecessor, John Carroll, was the cousin of Charles Carroll, the only Catholic signer of the Declaration of Independence. He had to move very carefully and very warily uh, in a new country that had uh, strong nativist leanings. Uh, more than leanings, I think, if when they were getting ready to build our nation's first cathedral, there was a lot of worry it would actually get burned down. So um, dialogue is, is, is not um, for the timid. It's, it's, it's difficult work. But number two, uh, we operate on many tracks at once. So while we are doing this, uh, I think it is important for us as Catholics to exercise our vote, the ballot box. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's important for us to make use of all the means at, at our disposal as citizens and members of the church to make our views known to our elected officials and to do so uh, not only in private conversations but also publicly. So we're doing all of this at once, not simply saying, well, we'll have a season of dialogue and then we'll see what comes of it. Um, I think we have to make the connections while at the same time defending ourselves in public as best we can. I think my larger point is that until and unless 
we as a Catholic community uh, know and understand our faith and know and understand what it is we need to be defending. Um, and unless and until we begin to engage our own Catholics more, our ability to discourse effectively in public will be compromised. I think that's really the point I was making. Thank you so much. Thank you, Archbishop Laurie, and thank you for all of you for coming out this evening for a very profitable uh, time together. Have a great night. Thanks. Thank you.